welcome back uh, today i'm going to just uh, initially start with a comment that i wanted to make on the final point uh, the error bound that we were talking about so one thing that was missing in the error bound i'm going to add it in a different color so there exist n m and k such that the error between v star and v pi k this is the p row error that's less than equal to some constant so remember this is this is a constant plus epsilon with probability 1 minus delta so one thing that i wanted to point out was first of all the k has to be sufficiently large okay so for all k greater than equal to k uh, so k has to be sufficiently large which means that you have to run the fitted value iteration for a pretty long time and the second thing is because of the fact that you are using a function approximator and the fact that tf doesn't lie within the same space as f uh, so there is a fundamental distance dp mu uh, between the set tf and f um, but the you you will not have a zero error at all uh, you will have some positive error uh, between your v star which is the optimal solution and v pi k which is the fitted value after k time step where k is larger than some threshold so this is something that i forgot to point out in the previous lecture so i thought i'll point it out in this lecture and now we'll move on to the topic for today which is policy gradient method okay so policy gradient methods is a class of methods which attempts to attempts to find an approximately optimal policy okay so what is the idea uh, let me define remember your v pi theta of s is given by Uh, expected value of summation r of s t a t oh i have to put let me use gamma now for the contraction coefficient because that's uh, something that a lot of people are using in recent reinforcement learning literature so gamma raised to t which is the discount factor raised to t the reward given that a t is distributed according to pi theta t s t at all times okay so this is uh, your value function and you want to maximize the value function over pi theta Oh, and s not equals to s okay um, let's assume that your s not is given so that way s not is not a random variable it's some uh, fixed variable so I can remove the dependence of v pi theta on s itself or well okay for clarity let's assume that the initial state s not is equal to s bar fixed okay I can rewrite so remember that my policy pi is parameterized using parameters theta so let's say your pi theta is a neural network which is what most of the examples are going to be like so pi theta is a neural network that maps the state space so the input layer is all the states and the output layer is a probability distribution p over all the actions now of course the actions here I'm assuming that the actions are uh, probability uh, sorry the actions are finite but if you have con continuous actions then so this is finite action case if you have continuous action then pi theta is going to be a neural network that maps s to a this is the continuous action case okay so i can now uh, remember my initial state is s bar okay so now i have parameterized my pi theta i want to find the best 
pi theta possible in this particular class um, of v pi theta of s bar. I can define this v pi theta s bar, I can define it as j of theta and I can say that I want to maximize with respect to theta and say rn. Okay, so this is the equivalent optimization problem that we want to solve. Now this actually looks very amazing, pretty amazing because uh, this is precisely what we had done in the EC5759. That entire class was exactly about this problem, trying to solve this problem. So how do you solve this problem? Well, what we need is um, we start with theta naught. So start with theta naught and uh, run the following iteration theta k plus 1 equals to theta k minus uh, some beta k which is the step size and gradient j at theta k okay so one thing i want you to notice is uh, that j of theta is equal to this infinite sum with the expectation okay so i'm not saying that it's easy to compute quantity and therefore gradient of j theta also may not be an easy to compute quantity but nonetheless conceptually we can run a gradient descent uh, assuming we can compute the gradient of j theta k and um, we can run this gradient descent algorithm so this is the usual steepest descent algorithm however uh, one thing you would al also remember is that there is no loss of uh, i mean you can also run gradient descent by introducing a positive definite matrix here so theta k plus one oh uh, this is a gradient ascent so i have to use a positive sign because we are doing the maximization so because of maximization this sign has to be positive well let me put use a different color because of the maximization i have to use a positive sign and i'm going to use the word ascent i can do also the following thing beta k uh, some dk gradient j theta k where dk is a positive definite matrix okay so this is also possible um, and uh, some in some situations where let's say dk is the second derivative inverse then it's called a newton's method uh, but if but dk could really be any positive definite matrix and this is also a valid form of uh, steepest ascent not steepest ascent but uh, a gradient ascent uh, algorithm so these are the two basic algorithms so most of the policy gradient methods are built on these two ideas except that you cannot really compute the gradient of j theta k exactly so you would come up with some approximate value of gradient of j theta k and you would run the uh, policy gradient method uh, in some situations you will have a positive definite matrix dk that you can use uh, so that people have used in the past and that has given good performance so we'll talk a little bit about those class of algorithms the third class of algorithm is uh, a bit more interesting so let me tell you how the algorithm works it's known as trust region optimization And the idea of trust region optimization is this. Let's say you have theta and you have a objective function like this. This is your j of theta. What we are going to do is, uh, let's say I'm sitting at theta k. Uh, the idea of trust region optimization is instead of trying to minimize j of theta at uh, 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 in the whole of theta, in the entire space over the entire space theta what you do is you come up with an approximation this is an approximation of let me call it j tilde of theta and this approximation is a very good approximation of j of theta in a neighborhood of theta k okay so j tilde theta 
is approximately equals to j theta in a neighborhood of theta k. Uh, in fact, let me let me write j tilde k. Okay, it is a good approximation in a neighborhood of theta k. So what we are going to do is so the trust region optimization method is. method says the following I am going to minimize j tilde k of theta over theta minus theta k some norm so I am not say, specifying what norm I am going to pick here you could be n infinity norm it could be two norm it could be other weighted norms okay so some norm less than equal to delta and the argmin will be theta k plus one Okay, so this is the trust region method uh, where um, you approximate the function uh, and then you try to minimize that function only in the neighborhood of theta k and get to the next point theta k plus 1 then again reapproximate the function and do the same optimization again and again. So, um, so this is the trust region optimization and there are a class of algorithms that we are going to talk about which uh, exploits this idea to uh, improve the convergence property of a policy gradient method. So in order to compute uh, an approximation to the gradient of j theta k which is needed for the policy gradient method, uh, we are going to talk about the policy gradient theorem next. Okay, so what is policy gradient theorem? Well, uh, policy gradient theorem says that your gradient of j theta is equal to this quantity. So q pi theta is the q function corresponding to the policy pi theta. So this q function is sometimes called action value function. So q function in some papers it's called action value function okay so both of them are synonymously used uh, in the literature now what is this uh, rho theta here so i want to use the red color so rho theta is probability of so rho theta s is a measure that's this measure they are equal so rho of pi theta is a measure over s is a measure over s uh, which is defined as follows so it is discounted remember gamma is the discount factor so it's a discounted sum of the probability that st is equal to s given that you started from s naught and uh, your policy was pi theta uh, with a multiplier 1 minus gamma in the front okay so that it becomes a probability measure over s it's a valid probability measure okay it can be shown so um, you go through some amount of math uh, and I'm, I'm, I've given the proof here, but uh, uh, but this uh, so I've given the proof here, but uh, the notations are slightly different from the notation used here. So I'm just going to make some comments about that. But I'm not going to go over the proof. I just wanted to show you that actually you can compute the gradient of j theta by computing the expectation with respect to this measure rho of pi theta uh, with respect to this measure of gradient of log of pi theta a given s and then q pi theta which is the q function uh, or evaluated at s comma a okay and then you have to divide it by 1 minus gamma okay so what's the proof of this result well the proof comes from the following uh, um, the following uh, ex set of expressions the only thing to note here is um, is that when you get here so you can go through it in your free time but when you get here you substitute um, uh, 
So when you get here, you substitute this. Uh, so see that this is a recursive equation. So the gradient is equal to gradient multiplied by Q plus pi multiplied by gamma multiplied by the transition kernel multiplied by the gradient of V pi with respect to theta at S prime. S prime is the next state. Okay, so uh, you can substitute the expression here and then you can, you will get an infinite series which is given by this expression. You can check it uh, in your free time and the only notation that's different here is the fact that this d pi s is the same as 1 over 1 minus gamma rho pi theta s. So these are the same notation. So this, this, this uh, derivation, this proof is actually coming from this paper and the paper where uh, this expression is used it's a re rather recent paper, 2019 paper, which I'll go through in the at a later time. Uh, this paper is merely citing this result and using their own notation to explain some of the stuff. So that's why the notations are different. Uh, this is a paper written in 2000. It's written above. And this is a paper written in 2019, which is citing their results. So I just picked things from two different papers. Uh, because of uh, the fact that I have to refer to this result again and again in the future. All right, so I will expect you to go through this proof later, um, very straightforward. And so the policy gradient theorem says that your gradient of j theta is given by, uh, so well, that showed that gradient of j theta is given by this expression. Now I'm going to show that even if you subtract from q pi theta a function purely of s, um, you don't actually uh, change the value of gradient of j theta, okay? And that's, this is the proof of this claim. So when you do the integration uh, with respect to pi theta, uh, what you see is that you get a gradient of 1 uh, multiplied by bs, but the gradient of 1 is actually equal to 0, so therefore this is this is equal to zero. This expression is equal to zero for any s in s, and that implies this would imply that gradient of j theta equals to one over one minus gamma <coughs> log pi theta multiplied by Q <coughs> is equal to, because of this expression, it's equal to 1 over 1 minus gamma expected value of And that's exactly this expression. <coughs> which is equal to gradient of j theta. Okay. So, okay, so now we have this expression for the gradient of j theta. Now, how do you compute an expectation of, how do you compute this uh, Expectation, well, during the simulation, you don't, you cannot compute the expectation, but you can compute the sample mean along a trajectory. And so the sample mean along the trajectory forms a, an approximation of gradient of j theta. <clears throat> and that's what you subtract at every point of time at policy gradient. So that gets to the first algorithm, which is called reinforce. And in reinforce, what you do is, you have a trajectory S0, A0, S1, A1, S2, A2, and so on. Oh, you also get R0, R1, R2, and so on. So you compute the gradient of J theta by
t equals to 0 to uh, let's say tau you have all the way up to state as tau um, yeah by theta a given s this gradient with respect to theta and then q pi theta s comma s of course you initialize with q pi theta at some point of time and then you keep using uh, keep updating the value of q function according to some of the other update rules we have talked about in the past so uh, this is not equal to this is an approximation so assuming this tau is sufficiently large uh, uh, you can um, it computes an approximation to the gradient of j theta and then that's what you use for your uh, uh, that's what you use for your gradient descent now this 1 minus some people like to write 1 over 1 minus gamma some people don't want to write 1 over 1 minus gamma but the fact is when you run the gradient descent or gradient ascent I should say this 1 over 1 minus gamma term gets absorbed in beta k and therefore all you are left with is t equals to 0 to tau of this whole term here okay so some people write uh, 1 over 1 minus gamma some people don't but don't get confused it's all absorbed in this step size beta k so that's uh, the very simple uh, algorithm reinforce I think it was uh, proposed around 1992 uh, I should have given the reference but I don't recall it now so uh, I'll update the notes with the reference um, the, the original reinforce uh, algorithm was the convergence was not given it was only given as an idea and uh, some numerical simulations and the actual convergence result was actually proved in 2019 in this paper there are various ways you can compute the an approximation to gradient of j theta so this is one way this is another way this is the third way and all these three ways gives you an unbiased estimate of the gradient of j theta so it's it's all unbiased estimate unbiased means that the expected value of the gradient is equal to the gradient itself okay because all of these are randomized algorithms because they depend on the uh, sample trajectory taken by the Markov decision problem under the policy pi theta okay so there are a lot of things you need to compute here so first of all pi of theta is given but you still need to compute Q of pi theta so how would you compute Q of pi theta so um, oh and you also need to compute V of pi theta so how would you compute these things well there are various algorithms to compute uh, an estimate of Q and estimate of V but one important thing that I want to point out is uh, while you try to compute your Q values uh, you draw your horizon T from a geometric distribution okay gamma is a discount factor so it's a geometric 1 minus gamma raised to half um, and then for for this random horizon you collect all the instantaneous reward and then you add q hat in this fashion that's how you get your value of q hat and then you simulate the next state and the action and so on and so forth and then you um, you get the value of q hat um, of pi theta at st a t okay and this value is then used in each of these algorithms similarly um, how do you compute uh, the value function V again you draw a horizon length from a geometric distribution you collect the samples and rewards um, until the end of the trajectory and then you update your V hat so remember your V hat is getting updated here and your V hat is getting updated here and then you use this V hat here and also in this expression 
Okay, so these are the two ways to compute the Q function and the V function. And then you run your what is known as random horizon policy gradient, which is you you get uh, TK plus 1 from the geometric distribution. Um, you collect the trajectory, you draw the action, you collect the trajectory, you obtain an estimate of Q function, then you perform the policy update in this particular fashion, and then you update the counter until you get to the convergence. So as long as you pick, so under this algorithm, uh, where should I write it? Oh yeah, so they have already given alpha k, so as long as alpha k is, so alpha k here is the step size, so as long as alpha k sums to infinity and is square summable, then this implies that theta k converges to theta star, which is a local minima. Well, actually I shouldn't say local minima. Uh, theta k converges to a stationary point theta star. So this is a convergence of policy, this is a proof of convergence of policy gradient method. There are some other restrictions required, for instance your pi of theta has to be Lipschitz in theta. So the assumptions, if I remember correctly, um, I encourage you to go back and read this paper, but I'll write the assumptions uh, that I recall. So assumptions are the reward is bounded. So r infinity is less than infinity, um, the log pi theta is Lipschitz, pi theta gradient theta log of pi theta is Lipschitz and bounded. Okay, so under these assumptions and the fact that your step sizes is summable, is not summable but square summable, uh, you, the authors use stochastic approximation theorem, the proof of which we have done earlier in lecture 8. So they use that theorem to show that theta k converges to one of the stationary points of the uh, ob objective functional j. So this is a first order algorithm. The idea is you you set theta k plus 1 equals to theta k plus uh, the derivative of uh, or, an, or an approximation to the derivative of j theta. Uh, the other algorithm uh, proposed in this particular paper is that you pick theta and you compute the value of, uh, so this is by the way, this is j of theta, this is gradient of j of theta, uh, where d is actually uh, computed in this fashion. So gradient of theta pi theta, gradient of theta pi theta transpose, and this is uh, distribution with res distribution over a and s with respect to the stationary distribution induced by pi theta. So this is known as the natural policy gradient because the D, D is a positive definite matrix. If it is not positive definite, you add some small identity matrix to it. And this gives you a second order method, uh, which is known as the natural policy gradient. Uh, it has good convergence property in comparison to reinforce algorithm. Uh, one thing I've, I want to say is that reinforce, uh, the trajectory tau was arbitrary. In the convergence proof, the authors show that the trajectory has to be according to a geometric distribution. So TK plus 1 has to come from a geometric distribution in order to be able to guarantee convergence, uh, which is kind of new insight. Uh, in the natural policy gradient, the author didn't talk about how long the um, horizon should be in order to collect the samples and um, uh, in order to collect the samples for estimating the value of 
d and estimating the value of gradient of theta j theta. So my guess is you should still use geometric, but I don't know because the convergence is not established. Of course, in, in, in simulation, everything, I mean, not everything, but it, it, it used to, at that point of time in simulation, this was the best algorithm, but now, of course, there are a lot more newer algorithms available in the market. The third part uh, that I wanted to talk about is what, what happens when you have uh, a, a, an off policy. So basically you have data S0, A0, R0, S1, A1, R1, and so on. This is coming from a policy mu, but instead, um, and, and this is the only information you have, and you want to run a policy gradient method on top of this. So remember in policy gradient method, every time you change theta zero to theta one, uh, then you have to compute gradient of j pi theta, gradient of j or theta one. Then you change from theta one to theta two, and then you need the gradient of j at theta two. So at every point of time you require the, the you, you need to compute the gradient for a different policy, but you don't actually have the information from that particular policy. The information you have is from a completely different policy mu. So what do you do then? So the idea is you, again, use important sampling for doing the off policy learning. So at every point of time, you, you have this, uh, Q pi theta S T A T and then you have gradient of log pi theta of A T given S T. Okay. You want to multiply it by rho of T of A T where rho of T of A this is the importance weight. And rho of t of a is given by pi theta of a given s over mu of a given s t. Okay, so this is known as the importance weight, and this is known as uh, uh, using important sampling. So every time um, you want to, so remember your gradient of j theta is approximated as summation t equals 0 to tau, tau is the length of the trajectory. Uh, you have to multiply the importance weight rho s a s, s equals to 0 to t and then gradient log pi theta multiplied by q pi theta okay this is all both of these are evaluated at st comma at so um so you use important sampling in order to weigh the gradients uh the reason you do that you use important sampling is because you have data from a different policy and you want to compute the gradient for a completely different policy so as long as this um, this uh, this, this uh, ratio is finite, you can run this uh, important sampling based method to compute the gradients and then run the policy gradient. Okay, so if you, so what we have discussed so far is the policy gradient theorem and how policy gradient uh, methods work. We have talked about two different policy gradient methods. One is reinforce and we talked about the convergence property of that. And then we talked about um, 
a natural policy gradient where you multiply a positive definite matrix to the gradient of j theta or an approximation to the gradient of j theta and then you, um, you, you run that algorithm and that seems to have a very good property in, uh, in simulation. Uh, there are some reasons for defining natural policy gradient, but I don't want to get into that. You can read the original paper for what the mathematical reasoning uh, was to use the specific positive definite matrix that we talked about. But there are problems with these methods. So first, uh, policy gradients in general have very high variance when you compute um, the gradients using simulations. And one of the ways people have figured to tame this uh, variance is to use a critic which evaluates the policy um, uh, using uh, some sort of uh, TD lambda kind of algorithm. Uh, but it introduces bias because you're using uh, the critic also is used using some sort of function approximator. So therefore you introduce bias into the algorithm but nonetheless uh, having an actor critic architecture seems to have um, uh, been of tremendous help within this area. The second problem is remember I talked about the important sampling in the previous slide and you want this ratio to be finite but, uh, uh, but in some situations the important sampling weights can blow up and then uh, that would happen if mu is far away from the optimal solution. Uh, then the idea is you clip the important sampling weights to some high level and after that you, you don't let them grow beyond that. Okay, so that also helps in convergence. And then uh, one of the major problems with policy gradient methods is that if you make a minor change in the critic network, then it can bring huge changes in the policy. And the reason for that is as follows. Actually, it's a very e easy region. Let's say you are, um, remember that the optimal policy is always a deterministic policy for any MDP. Okay, so um, I want to use something to show, let me, let me use D to show a deterministic policy. So this is a deterministic policy. So let's say this is the space of value functions v and if you pick a v here then d1 is optimal and if you pick a v here then d2 is optimal. Um, so what happens is uh, as you are let's say d2 uh, let's say this is your v star okay so you started from here and then you are constantly moving towards v star. So when you are when you are when you are at this location, the optimal policy seems to be d1. But as soon as you move to this location, suddenly your optimal policy became d2. Um, when you ran the actor in the within the actor critic architecture, when you ran, ran the actor which computes the optimal policy corresponding to that particular value function, uh, you realize that d2 is the optimal policy, and then your entire policy network uh, starts changing all the weights in order to um, get pi theta 2 close to d2. Okay, now imagine when you have large number of actions, then your policy space is huge, the space of deterministic policy space, so it might look something like okay, uh, this is the value function space, and so as you are moving from v0 to let's say v star, um, you're going to go through several policy changes and your policy could change very significantly from one region to another. And, uh, and so therefore minor changes in the critic architecture. So remember if you move from this point to this point, the critic architecture has, I mean the critic, the weights in the critic uh, function uh, has not really changed much, but your policy has changed significantly. So so that's what this basically problem is that minor changes in the critic network can bring huge changes in the policy and therefore people have proposed to use trust region optimization in order to um, make sure that the policy doesn't change significantly if the critic has changed a little bit. So with that I'm going to end the lecture here. Uh, in the next class we're going to talk about actor critic method and uh, different classes of actor critic methods. 
which involves policy gradient uh, in the next uh, next class.